Yes. So, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Sorry that I can't release you already to celebrate all these awards in uh, outside in a reception. So. I think you are strong enough to stand another half an hour <laughs> or a bit longer. And I, I think I have to start with that. We all have a story with uh, M Professor Winnaker. Mm. Because when I was a young man, I, I lived in East Germany uh, and I was uh, uh, yeah, a PhD student still. And I got a call from my friend. She worked in a bookshop. And she said, Michael, there is a book, Gene und Klone, Genes and Clones, uh, five, five books only. Mm -hmm. If you are interested, hurry up and go there. So I rushed into <laughs> the bookshop and bought all five, actually. <laughs> 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 uh, you, mu you must have seen that in your uh, current account that day. <laughs> Uh, no, but uh, I use that book and it's still in my bookshelf at home uh, for all my lectures I gave to students, uh, introducing them into uh, gene technology. And I, I can really tell you, uh, if you still get the book, I think it's, it's still there to buy. It's still after 40 years, everything is true what's, what's in there. So uh, thank you for doing <laughs> that. So uh, we want to discuss uh, a question, actually. We called it science and society, a broken relationship. And we put a question mark at the end because we don't know. Is it a broken relationship? Or I will hear from you, or you think maybe half broken, or it's, or when you say it's not broken, then we can have the <laughs> reset. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's the point of discussion. Uh, I think what we all, if you uh, watched and listened to all the talks this afternoon, there was one theme. We, science is beautiful. Science want to do it in our heart, but if we don't uh, get the society convinced about what we are doing, we are lost. So I had to learn that the hard way. I was a gene technologist from the beginning. So in, I was enthusiastic as a young man. I cloned my first gene in 1979. So it's even more than 40 years ago. <laughs> and uh, so then I thought everybody will now celebrate together with me. but. <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> so uh, I had to learn the hard way what I'm doing. I'm excited about. I'm still excited about genetics. Uh, but if we don't get society on board, uh, it doesn't even make sense to do it. Yeah? Then we have to change. So therefore, uh, I think we have to speak uh, and we have to discuss does that point. Uh, I watched last night on uh, Wilts, uh, <laughs> because I'm not a moderator, so I watched uh, <laughs> her, her talk show. <laughs> and what I learned, that was the only thing, everybody has it's a bunch cards. of cards <laughs> in, in their head. So right. what I did last night, I wrote cards. Whether <laughs> something is on, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but you need, you need, <laughs> it feels good. <laughs> you need cards in your hand. <laughs> yes, questions. <laughs> OK. So. Uh, what I also did was I looked up uh, what a relationship is about. So psychologists can define relationships. Yeah? We all have relationships, I think. Yeah? We are married or not married. We have relationships. Uh, and they define three Cs. And that maybe is a good basis for our discussion. So the first C is communication. We spoke about that. That's the easy one. The second one is compromise. So my question then immediately is, can we make compromises as scientists or we are bound to truths and facts? So, but nevertheless, we have to make compromises, maybe. And the last one, the third one is commitment. Uh, how committed are we? Uh, I, I remember colleagues of mine when I said, come on, we go to school in Leverkusen and tell uh, pupils about the beauty of science. And sometimes I got the answer, no, I have no time for I'm doing that. I'm a scientist at the company. I have to work. So uh, what is commitment? How far can, can we go as, as scientists? So I don't have to introduce the panelists. You heard such a lot. Uh, maybe just some citations uh, about Antje Boetius. Uh, it's written that she is very much, that she very much believes in the need of conversation around issues of deep sea uh, ecosystems, biodiversity, and our vision on how to live with a 
Future Ocean. Uh, welcome <laughs> to the uh, panel. Then uh, we have uh, Jane, uh, no, Jean Rubner. Uh, and that's very interesting. The Bertelsmann Agency wrote about you. I, I don't know whether you know that. Uh, Jean Rubner is valued for her provocative thesis and her intelligent and factual arguments. And you wrote a book or a publication, Crazy, what we can learn from mystics in our brain. <laughs> I, I always wanted to learn <laughs> about the mystics in, in my brain. And then, of course, we have Patrick. I don't have to introduce you. Uh, we heard such a lot about you today. Uh, but again, if you look what other people say about you is that Patrick commits himself to the further development of life sciences in Germany and Europe. So that's your area. US, I don't know. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, Patrick is advisor of the Bavarian uh, government and worked a lot on bioethics, which fits to what, what, we, are, uh, wh what we want to discuss today. So I start with a very simple question. Uh, do you speak about that? Is that a question or should we remove the question mark immediately? Or please, without going into detail, maybe we start with a very simple uh, question and answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, but you looking at me, I'll, 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 I'll take the lead here and start. Uh, I think I, I would leave the question mark because definitely I don't think it's a broken, a totally broken rela re relationship. But we definitely have to talk about what's sort of what seems to be going wrong. And uh, uh, to give a short answer, I think we definitely we saw we saw actually what can go wrong during the pandemic. Yeah, yep, yeah. the Corona uh, pandemic was kind of like a you know we, we saw we say in, in German a Brennglas or you know a mag magnifying glass of what where the communication problems can be between science and society. And I think one important thing is that I think the general public doesn't really understand that science and research is not about absolute truth, but it's always about finding a way about interpreting data. Um, so you often you have different scenarios which apply. We saw that also, you know, during the pandemic. We did, especially when you don't have complete data, when you, uh, when, uh, when you don't have all the data you need to, to make assessments. So I think this is, this is a, a very important point that we need to, you know, what science and research is about, yeah, that it's mm -hmm. always searching for the truth. Uh, it's always a very often a question of, of interpreting data and different scenarios. And I think if that is something we can, as scientists, or that scientists can transport as a message that will not fix everything, mm -hmm. not fix all the problems, but, but uh, would, uh, would help a great deal. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we come to more details uh, anyway, yeah? and because you describe the, the big frame yeah, of it. Ante? <laughs> yeah, I, I also think it's not generally broken. Um, uh, among the three C's, I'm missing the letter T for trust. <laughs> and I think that um, when we look at the, the measurements we have, questionnaires we have about how does society trust in science is actually very high yeah. globally, but also in Germany especially high. We have been during the pandemic, it was as high as 70% and now it's the normal, I think 60 or something. And the question is as simple as do you trust in science? Yes, no. And so when you think about it yourself, is it absolute trust? You also like to ask questions about methods, about where do we go? So maybe not even you would just give this absolute yes, but the majority of people just give this absolute yes, I trust, which is huge. I mean, if you compare it to police or media or the government, they're all much lower <laughs> than science. But it is not to just, just relax and say, okay, everything is great. We don't have to care about it. There's so much trust that the relationship must be great. It is. Um, it needs to be earned, that trust. And th there we are right in the matter mm -hmm. of the relationship uh, fixing because people know that the future is really more uncertain than it potentially ever was for various reasons. And then you ex then it's not enough to rely on trust. You want to know, you want to be accompanied, you want to know the risk, you want to be mm. spoken to and with. And there we have to do more in science, I think, in the next uh, decade. 
Okay, thanks a lot. Patrick, as uh, new I much agree president. with what has been said, and maybe um, building on what Antje said, uh, I think the latest numbers are 62% in Germany uh, trust the science and the scientists. But you have to ask yourself, what about the 38%? And so I think the answer to your question is actually it depends, but what does it depend on? And the elephant in the room is it depends on education. It depends on education because those studies clearly show when you um, take different groups of the population and you sort people simply according to you know, the, the school leaving certificate, then you have a much higher percentage you know if people have a higher level of education that trust the science is much lower for other people and so what does that mean it means uh, this, that this relationship is broken for part of the population where we don't manage to convey any messages and also maybe there's no interest and the question is how can we what can we do about it and i think it's very important to start early you know, we have to, it's about uh, mm. childcare mm. and school. We have to go to schools. Actually, last week, uh, some of the young scientists at our institute went to the Göttingen schools. And we had that program f ongoing for many years called Max Planck Goes to School. Mm. And so they like it. You know, it's PhD students and they spend two hours or so in school and they tell in very simple words the, the students about what they're doing in the laboratory. And I'm really convinced that this makes a difference because it's all about people. You don't trust science or politics or industry. You trust people. And so if you see such a young man, such a young woman as, as a student in school, you know, burning for the issue, being excited, telling you what potentially this can do to the world, mm -hmm. then that, you know, connects you and that makes you trust because you have a face identifying, you know, with science. That's something I'm convinced of. Okay, we, again, we will come to more, more details. So at least uh, I, I see the, the question has a meaning and we, we should discuss uh, how maybe how we can solve uh, many of these problems. But before uh, we start with that, uh, are we as scientists the right people to do that or do we need the media take over you are uh, <laughs> a, a yes. science journalist <laughs> of course uh, because i i felt always that's a privilege to be a scientist yeah so somehow you combine your hobby with your work you are fairly free how you uh, arrange your your time and uh, Maybe that's what I thought about it. That maybe is one of the problems people have with us, yeah, because oh, this the science, the elite science people, they have a nice life, they work hard without any doubt, but uh, they live in another world. Do you think uh, this is part of the issue? Uh, yes, I, I, I would like <laughs> would like to answer because you know I, I, I kind of experience now both sides, right? I, um, so now working closely closely with researchers, but having been a science journalist before, I would say yes. I mean, you have to. I think you have to use all the ways you can to communicate science, and and I think. Science journalists or media that specialize on science or or big newspapers that have a science section, uh, the uh, German public radio and TV, uh, there's a lot of science shows. Yes, you have to use them because they're very valuable intermediaries, as we call them. And, uh, and in, in general, science journalists are the friends of, of science. I mean, they're very close to scientists. They mm. usually, often they have a, a, a scientific background and, and I mean, their job is to, to explain. So that, that's very important, I think, to, to realize that, that, uh, that this is a, a very impo important way to, to, to explain how results, you know, how, what, what the results of scientific research are. But at the same time, and as Patrick said, people trust people, it's important that scientists themselves also mm. speak up, that they that they come to the public as you know, she's really probably go to schools, go to T V shows and, and, and really and really explain what you're doing in order to, you know, like to yeah, there's a human being who is the you know, searching for the truth, trying to find answers. Those are equally important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
any more comments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a. I think we we have a good uh, deal to do, and I liked it, uh, Frank. If I may, so, so in your in your speech, you you also mentioned this question: Oh, can we be the good chemist? Mm -hmm. Can we be the good scientist? And when you go through the history of science and science communication, I can just recommend the book of uh, Jürgen Renn, a colleague and friend of mine, *The Evolution of Knowledge*. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the tiniest mm -hmm. letters, and it's uh, 600 pages and no images. So <laughs> <laughs> you have to do a lot of reading to go through it, but you can look at it and you can understand what uh, it is really about evolution of society and science and this question of what is good in these times is really important mm -hmm. and I think we cannot we, we have to go to places that are new fresh different and so I'm trying right now to to do work about the science method and the question of the profession of science in film and fiction mm -hmm. because I'm intrigued by this question, what do kids of today think about that profession of a scientist? Like when I was a kid, I had no clue. I wanted to be at sea on a ship and it didn't matter what it was as long as it was on a ship. And scientist was just one of the many solutions in my mind because there was nothing on television that would satisfy my idea what research and science was about. I mean, later there were some series, now we have a lot of them. It's probably changing, it becomes more uh, touchable um, what it mm. is. Mm -hmm. But I think we can think more about what an important part of culture, and again, you said it, it's like art sometimes. If we understand the culture of knowledge and the diversity of knowledge and the boundaries thereof, we can be also more playful and go to areas where people have actually no contact. And mm -hmm. that's what I like to do more of yeah. today. That's an important point. And I mean, it touches also to what Patrick says, the 38% that we, you know, maybe that don't totally distrust science, but they don't really understand what science is about, and they, they have kind of a sort of a halfway trust maybe, but uh, but uh, not a total trust. And there you have to you have to think of new solution, uh, new, new ways of mm -hmm. finding the public. I mean, there's like this in, in the States, you have the, like Science Goes Hollywood. Yeah, you have a cooperation between the National Academies of Sciences and, and Hollywood uh, producers mm -hmm. in order to get, to get scientific topics in, mm -hmm. in fiction formats, right? So that's one way one unconventional way in uh, you know reaching the public in other ways you know we talk a lot about finding new locations dritte orte to um, to uh, to um, talk to people yeah to address people and public engagement is about you know going also to places where the public is not not expecting the public to 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 read intelligent newspapers or to see mm. to see science shows but to really go there where mm. you find the 38 percent but, that but is there change. really a public or do we have if we want if you have a message a specific message yeah, you you want to speak about the deep, deep sea do we have to adjust our message to different uh, to different publics uh, is it mm. absolutely yeah. I mean, I can probably tell a quick story, not about the 38%, but a subfraction of those 38% uh, that uh, have a preoccupied opinion no matter what, and who are basically um, cannot be reached by rational arguments or data because they don't accept the concept of you know what we all accept that you ask a question and you observe and you are neutral so you know when in the middle of the pandemic when the first um drugs became available remdesivir and and these um then you know we did some research on those just on you know the mechanism so journalists would ask me you know for interviews and so forth and i was also in one of these online tv shows and i got the question oh now that we have drugs we don't need to get vaccinated right <laughs> and so this was in the middle of the pandemic and i said of course please all get vaccinated you know we need to have um, broad immunity and then for exceptional cases we have the drugs and the next day i had 1900 messages on this youtube channel and uh, basically people calling me anything you know i would uh, uh, i don't even say it <laughs> but um this was an experience where and i read some of the comments a few hundred or so then i stopped um, um 
And the, the issue was the following. These people did not sometimes not even listen to the, the show. Mm -hmm. But they were in this bubble of the anti-vaxxers and they had decided that it's a conspiracy, it's the rich people who want to implement robots in, in, in our bodies and so forth. And so they were in this bubble and just reacting and just being in that bubble and following the stream, you know. And the question is, can I don't know how many percent, it has been estimated maybe 5% or so, depending mm. on which country you live in. But um, can we ever reach them and how would we? And should we tr even try or should we concentrate on keeping the majority to preserve our democracies? Because it's a serious threat to democracy once you give up the principle of enlightenment. Mm. Yeah, if, if this is not an agreement anymore, mm. uh, then I think you endanger democracy because people will not be able to reach conclusions based on rational grounds and then they will also you know, have take decisions during election which are mm. not mm. funded in anything. Mm. So and that is and so wasn't the weird thing actually that for vaccination questions it was not correlated to education yeah. status. It was actually a bit the reverse, at least in the first year when I remember the data, right? So um, the question to be available for conflict and dialogue, mm. that's something where we have to find ourselves a better way and I think the role of university is actually underestimated and it's also difficult because um, to organize it on places you can go that are in your cities that are open where you have the diversity also of science uh, disciplines which are often needed in debates. Um, I think the, the role of knowledge and knowledge dialogue and public engagement should be increased and the support there should be increased at mm. universities. Yeah, I mean, the vaccination, that's true, is, a, is a s maybe also a little a bit a special example because <coughs> in Germany we have a lot of, lot of academics, yeah. I, I mean, people who have an academic background who, who don't believe in vaccination, right? And especially with the RNA vaccines, you know, mm. like mm. there were a lot of myth around. And I recently read an interesting paper that, that uh, they compared this, this disinformation and the and um, this information when it came to to vaccines and other other scientific uh, issues to like magics like the the brain the brain kind of makes up you know makes up the missing pieces um, in order to construct a reality that's not mm. that's not real so you have to try to i mean to answer the question you know what how do you how do you reach people or where do you reach them yes you have to you have to find very many different ways of reaching people and uh, and and try to to find them where they are but don't don't think that it's going to be easy to just by just mm. explaining you know mm. you're going to have to understand why people don't buy what mm. you know what you as a scientist try to to sell and 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 uh, you have to react to that i i would like to maybe add one thing i mean when it comes to W when it comes to like the uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, but also other scientific c controversies, we tend to, as a media, and you know, I'm, um, unfortunately, uh, this is true for for even serious uh, serious uh, newspapers and serious broadcasting companies. We try to take also the the small minority of non-believers to serious right we we often we over amplify some opinions it's not i mean i'm not uh, i mean the vaccination is a little bit different because there was more than a, a small minority of people um but uh, but we try to make a big thing out of you know like one or ten or hundred tweets mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and we over and we tend to over amplify um, uh, sort of minority opinions, and we should also, mm. you know, realize that and and try to mm. act against so, that. So uh, we need social medias, even uh, at the price that it can go wrong. Yeah, that uh, absolutely maybe a shit storm. Even if you if just you take the shit storm. Mm. Patrick did. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but I have another idea where I think scientific methods can be used to help everyone. And this, this part of the scientific method overlaps also with other parts of culture and even religion. And that is the question of the future, pictures of a future. 
So often when I talk to people and I go to places, you know, where it's not the scientific audience, then the the people would like to know what does the future hold for me, for my kids, for future generations? What does it look <coughs> like if I decide this way or the other way? Mm -hmm. And we have really strong tools and technology, some were mentioned today even, um, to, to be better at uh, painting pictures of a future that is worth fighting for or worth mm -hmm not going that way. And so I sometimes think there, we probably in the last decades did not use that, or we, are, we have slowly begun with um, the help of modeling. But when you look at our uh, projections, they are very m one dimensional. They haven't managed to really paint a picture of a future. And that's missing because especially in Germany and Europe, where basically religions don't give the pictures of a future that well, where the whole institutions often start failing about that, that there could be a place where we could work together with others and try to, be, to, to you know, address what does the future look like? What happens on that path? But not one dimensional, like in my science, climate sciences for, for decades, it was just painting you know, the level of CO2 and connecting it maybe mm. with temperature only. Mm. But now we understand that it is about biodiversity, about health, about so many more things. Mm. But we don't use the ability of our human brain enough to actually project and decide ba on the basis of, uh, of future mm. images. So when, when should we start to communicate? I mean, in age, uh, because uh, you get the impression the excitement and science is gone yeah, when you speak to teenagers. I over overdo <laughs> it now, but uh, so when when should we actually approach uh, people in kindergarten? As soon as possible. Mm -hmm. I think I think these programs at kindergarten or preschool are very successful. I think that's where you where you mm -hmm. get the kids, and they're they're usually very open and and uh, to to science. You can do you know like experiments. I think it's. It's important to to explain to explain how you know <laughs> what is science about, and I know, but it it goes through all ages. I'm, I'm I'm convinced that we need to do more. I mentioned public engagement, more public engagement research. We also need to bring you know like to bring non-experts into the labs. That doesn't mean that they're gonna work with <laughs> Patrick on really complicated um, uh, research questions, but there is lots of lots of research we're doing um, that where we can use the, you know, like, and I'm talking not only about citizen science, where citizens bring in data, but I'm talking about, you know, bringing, bringing the expertise of society into, into the labs. Okay. Good. Maybe. <laughs> can I add one thing, you know, just a thought. Um, uh, often here when you see parents educating their little children, of course they try to keep them away from the electronics, from the uh, smartphones and so forth. But maybe what we need is that we, um, like with all media, right? Once there was the first day of a telephone or the first day of the radio or first day of the television, we need to learn how to work with them. And I've seen, for example, young group leaders developing software based on these kind of chatbot technologies, AI technologies, where kids can actually talk to the machine and learn, you know, within a protected framework. It's a software that is it's protected, it's for kids, that's what they're developing. And you can basically ask simple questions about life, about the earth, and the chatbot is explaining to you and kind of interacting with you. And it's basically the next generation of a computer game, but it's uh, really um, education at the same time. And I think it needs to have some open-mindedness to also make use of those mm. new technologies. It doesn't replace a teacher, but they are playing on the smartphones anyway. So why not, you know, giving them half, telling them you can have the smartphone for half, half an hour, but only using that software. And this is the kind of cultural change that it probably needs. Um, yeah, I'm thinking more in this direction. And okay. uh, I think the issue is in Germany, we had just had that again, that it so much depends on the parents, you know, the chances that the kids have, how far they get with education. And that is what is really, really concerning me. My wife is a social worker, so I learn almost every day about the situation. And, you know, there's no money for education. There's, the parents don't have 
they're not healthy or they don't have the background to convey these messages. So I think we also in Germany need to have a serious discussion that every child goes to school the whole day and that they can, you know, spend the afternoon with, uh, you know, doing sports, learning how to cook, all, all these things. And we need money for that. Yeah. We have to have that discussion. Look at France. They have been doing that for generations. And, you know, we should learn from them. And we need good teachers at the same time at school. Absolutely. But I also think, I mean, that's absolutely necessary for the kids to create an environment of learning and using, as you say, all technologies that are available, including, you know, walking and looking at, at life, <laughs> everything. But there is also such a demand of the new things we have learned in recent years about Earth and how it works. Um, I was recently invited and I was really amazed. I was invited to the Association of the Farmers of Hesha and I'm a polar and marine deep sea researcher, what can I give those farmers? I mean, I'm from Hesha too, so maybe that was the connecting point. Mm -hmm. But then I had to, I could spend a day with farmers and um, hear about their sorrows with climate change and hear about their ambition to uh, do their job at best. And I, after a few talks, I understood, wow, these are the people that practically work with plants, but they don't understand what soil is. And so they don't, they can actually not understand yet what is to come about the erosion of soil, the destruction of soil mm. from future weather patterns. And then I thought, well, they are all, the ones with the large farms, they are between 50 and 70 maybe. Mm. And it's some, and then it's true, the soil biology has solved the question what soil and humus and all of that actually is, what is good soil? We have solved that only in the last 10 years. And that is a discrepancy of the ones that are organizing, deciding, doing the work, and the new learning we have provided in science, and where can they go to, to understand? Mm -hmm. And so to be available to understand as scientists where is knowledge needed, for that we need support and we need translation and a bit better ability to be fast yeah. in that period of transition. And there, I sometimes wonder if this awkward split we have between science and industry and science and academia, if that is enough in these times, if we should not act more together rather than in controversy. It's very as interesting that you say that. It's on my, one it's on on my cards. Yeah, yeah I, can, <laughs> I can read them through the backside of your cards. Really? <laughs> <laughs> can, I just can, add, <laughs> can I just Can I just add something? I think it's really important. And I mean, you probably heard of the, you know, like third mission of the universities and next to educating, next to research. The transfer, I mean, transferring the knowledge and by this, um, we not only mean like creating companies or so also, but, you know, really making an effort to, to, to give, you know, to share the knowledge that we're that we're producing and it won't not only applies to universities of course but also to Helmholtz centers and and um, all kinds of research institutes and I I think there's there's pr I see progress I think the younger scientists are really often engaged and understand that this, uh, this is part part of the job I sometimes understand also when somebody says oh my god now I have to you know I have to write papers I have to give a lecture and and you Still, I also want me to communicate. Yes, but you know that is the you know we 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 need this this trust and this approval of science and and we need research that's really f rooted in society and that yeah. that means a, a big effort of of uh, you know explaining and 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 communicating. But this clear cut between industrial research and academic research, I think it's something we have, especially in Germany, yeah, because I spent a lot of time in the US. There you are even asked, so what are your links to industry? So d you don't have any, why not? And so, so is that a cultural problem, our problem? Maybe that goes too far? Mm. No, I, I don't think so. I just think that uh, not every researcher is the same, right? It's not one size fits it all. Mm -hmm. There's people like Frank Glorius or, or Antje uh, who are extremely good communicators. Um, and there's other people who are not. But maybe they can do something else really, really well. Mm. And so we ha I think everybody has to have the chance to choose from this portfolio of things that are important to do the things that... Mm -hmm are really close to your heart and where you also are talented. Because exactly as you say, if every professor would have to, to 
to everything. Score very yeah. high in all these three different areas. Mm. You have to be almost superhuman to, <laughs> to achieve. Um, so that is my opinion. But like the technical university as a whole has to achieve that or the Max Planck Society or Helmholtz as a whole has to achieve that. Mm -hmm. So you have to have your communicators, your top scientists, you have to have your edu educators. That's more the way I look at it. Okay, so I still have two C's actually. <laughs> so <laughs> 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 communication is key. That's yeah. that's clear. Yeah, I think, and we, uh, I, I like very much that we didn't just say it's a problem. That, but there have been suggestions uh, how to do it better. We need new media. We need other ways to communicate. We have to adjust to uh, the audience, the different audiences. Yeah, so that's that's what I think we as scientists have to learn as well. But. Another C I'm interested in is compromise. So c can we make compromises as scientists? Because uh, actually we have to uh, argue on, on facts. Uh, we have really not to make any compromise. Or, or what would be our compromises when uh, a demonstration outside against gene technology, I, I saw that many times our institute was blocked by demonstrants. So what, what's my compromise there? I, I said we tried to speak to them but it didn't work. So what, what can, can we do? So how far should we go to say, okay, uh, society doesn't accept what we are doing. Uh, we don't do it. Is that a way out? Should I start on? Mm. So I mean, <coughs> maybe best to look at an example. So since you're interested in green biotech, we can, we can just look at golden rice. Mm. So the, the science was clear in the 90s. I think the publication was there around the millennium saying that, you know, you can engineer rice to make carotene and that, of course, can be converted in vitamin A and then this prevents blindness in children, right? So you would just plant this rice and you're fine. You don't have these tens of thousands of cases of blindness in tropical countries. And then it took until last year, until the Philippines, 22 years later, allowed for planting of the rice. And I just read that now there's, they harvested 67 tons mm -hmm. of the golden rice, which is a start. Um, so what I want to say with this is the compromise is not, cannot be on the science. Right, on the science as a discourse, but then there's a truth, right? You, if it's reproducible, and uh, then this is how it is, right? And we cannot compromise there. But of course, the implementation needs compromise. It depends on the country, the cultural background, the how much money is available, which companies are available, on the market mechanisms. That's also very important for things to succeed, right? You have to understand how our market works. But then sometimes it takes a generation, and that's why. I you know, want to discuss that example of the golden rice because we can get there. I mean, the, you can convince people there will be a next generation. People will get more open-minded. Can also go the other way, but it's that's the compromise, but not on the science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, often we have to discuss the risks of what we are doing. Eh? So I don't know how many uh, discussions I had on the risk of gene technology. Uh, should we? rather move to the benefits and be proactive saying come on there are always risks if if you eat chocolate the I, risk I would say you have to always argue in scenarios you know there's no it's not like a or B, you know, mm. is a scenario A and a scenario B. And we learned that during the pandemics, you know, it wasn't clear. We, Of course, we had incomplete data, but we saw at the end that the, the discussion evolved and we saw that we have to, that the com situation was much more complex than just controlling the virus it was also about you know the psychology and the uh, of uh, the psychological problems of closing schools and so on so i think we have to be, we have to always make it clear that 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 the world is complex there's no easy solutions we often have you know we often have pro and cons mm. and and i would always think you have to argue in, in, in scenarios and explain what is going to happen, you know, what, what is that path, you know, what is going to happen if we don't mm. use the golden rice now, we're going to have to, to deal with these many cases of, of blindness. Um, so I, I think that's the better way than to just to say to have one scientist saying, mm. okay, mm. I know this is good for you. 
we need this golden rice and okay so I, th I think it's obvious that science happens in a in a societal and ethical context and it, it must do so as everything else nothing is free of rules and should be and um, we cannot avoid the conflict that arises i mean in the beginning when you referred to harbor and you know solving the problem of fertilizer i i i understand this but i also always think of harbor as someone who helped invent uh, the um, the toxic gases that killed millions. And so a scientist, an excellent scientist, and the invention itself is in a way neutral. It is good research in both ways. But what we make of it, what do we make of it? That is the environmental, con uh, that's the environmental and societal context. So for us as scientists, and no matter what scientists that is, if it's economy or chemistry or everything, we can only act with respect to the, to the societal context. And we need to learn how to do that. We need to take decisions about that, and we should not forget to speak about it. I sometimes find science and science education much too history-free to uh, trust in what I deliver. So I, I try to, to weave that into the, the teaching that I do. But um, we have a task there to always show, you know, we, we bet you better know the method, the technology, but always the societal context. Okay. To be a, a good chemist, a good yeah. scientist. May I add one example? <laughs> I mean, what we're doing at... 30 at seconds. 30 <laughs> uh, at <laughs> what we're trying to do at, uh, at Turmat Technical University is to incorporate more into the education of our engineers to incorporate you know political societal sociological knowledge you right. know to you say that there, as you said, there is there is science, but it, science doesn't doesn't uh, it works in a framework in a societal framework, and you have to know mm. what uh, what the world around you mm. is is how it is working, mm. what the relationships are, what the the rules are. Yeah, it's almost a closing. What you said, you, you said. Uh, Can you have Patrick <laughs> giving yeah, a closing I give remark? I the last <laughs> word, of course. <laughs> uh, the world is complex, but the time is <laughs> limited. That's uh, that's, uh, that's <laughs> your problem, Patrick. Yeah, you should. should uh, I can say one sentence. I think it's uh, up to the scientists to derive positive scenarios for the future. Because who should, if not us? Mm. Hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So. Um, I'm excited again now <laughs> to have spoken to uh, three excellent expert scientists, and I'm optimistic. I'm always opti optimistic. Never, we will never give up. We will, we will really uh, keep science going. You can't stop science, even if you would give up. There are others. Uh, we we saw young young people, which publish already papers uh, which I have dreamed of when I was in, in your age. <laughs> but there's technology, of course, developing. So thank you very much. And uh, we can't finish that discussion. That was clear from the beginning because the world is complex and this issue is very complex. But uh, we, will, we will improve, actually, our interaction with society. And for me, very important is not to uh, make a big gap, a, a big valley between industry and academia. I, I was in academia, I was a lecturer, I was in a startup company, I worked for Bayer, and I, I didn't change. I, I'm a scientist and I think uh, the world, everybody has to do what he, she wants to do in a special way, but uh, we are all scientists and we want to to do something for the future. And that needs insights into the history. You are very right as well, yeah? So we, I, I uh, followed a lecture when I was a student, the history of genetics, and that was very exciting because then you understood suddenly why things had changed. Okay, thank you very much, and I think this is worth an applause. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. We are, at, we are at the end, and of course, now there's the fun part of today. There's the reception, the big fun part. It was all fun, of course. Yeah. And uh, please, all speakers and awardees, please stay here for uh, a photo. And uh, outside, there is the reception. And I have to announce, and don't forget that, uh, there will be a foundation report published in March, March 8, the Women's Day, actually. Yeah? It's March 8. And, uh, so you find that on the back of your uh, program here and read it because there's a lot more what's uh, done in, in the 
Foundation and the Bayer Foundation. And uh, see you next time. And we are looking forward to the next Nobel Prize. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, reception and a photo. <laughs> <laughs>